Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're out at the range to talk about an interesting piece of history. The handgun I have in my hands is a VZ Model 27, sold commercially as the CZ Model 27. This handgun was developed in the 1920s. It was based upon the VZ-24, which was an earlier Czech military pistol design, and it was intended to be a replacement for that model. Around mid-1939, Nazi Germany occupied Czechoslovakia, took over small arms manufacturing, and the gun that I have here was manufactured under German occupation. So this one bears the marks of Nazi Germany. It has uh, Waffenamps and stuff on it that would signify that this was manufactured during the occupation period. But after the war, the gun continued on into production until the mid-50s or right around 1950 or so. I'm kind of fuzzy on the dates. Again, I'm not a historian. I leave that up to Ian over at Forgotten Weapons. I know just enough to be dangerous. However, the guns did continue on in production after the end of World War II. Well, after the end of World War II, some of these guns were sold to Switzerland, it's been rumored, but some other guns were manufactured and sold to unknown sources, and this is not uncommon. And what I want to show you in the video is what I call a scrubbed gun. Some people call them spook guns or special operations, secret operations guns. These are guns that have all their manufacturer markings removed professionally, typically by the manufacturer or some other third party, so that the weapons that are being used in conflict zones can't be really traced back to any one party. This was common in the Rhodesian War, for example. They would deface FN fouls. They would remove the manufacturer's marking. I mean, everybody knew they were being made by FN or some other uh, licensed manufacturers of the rifles, but they would still deface them for whatever reason. I am lucky enough to have a version of this pistol that is a spook or covert operations gun that nobody can seem to tell us the history on. Matter of fact, if you jump on Google right now, once I show you this pistol and look at the markings, you'll find very little information out there, but a whole lot of speculation as to what the gun is. Now, I did consult with Ian over at Forgotten Weapons. He was intrigued by the firearm, and I'll let you know what he, what he shared with me with regards to what probably happened and how this gun came into being, and what it definitely, or most likely, isn't. So the Model 27 fires a 32 ACP. I have nine rounds loaded into this little tiny magazine. This is dangerously close, guys, to being considered an assault weapon by Diane Feinstein and her group. It has nine rounds in the magazine. The gun does feature a magazine safety, an external hammer, very rudimentary sights. Uh, again, I'll get some close-ups and show you the, mar the markings on this one so you can see the German proof marks and things like that, showing that this was a wartime production handgun under occupation. But it shoots the 7.65 Browning, which is 32 ACP, has a heel release in the magazine. Again, it does have a magazine safety. It is a single action pistol. So when you charge the weapon, it chambers around, the hammer stays back. It does have a manual safety right here. And you can apply that safety when the weapon's cocked. To release the safety, it's a little bit awkward. You see that little, little ball right there? You push that with your thumb and that takes the safety off and the weapon's now ready to fire. So it's fire magazine out of this German manufactured or occupation manufactured handgun. And let's take a look at that special operations covert gun that I've been talking about. This, ladies and gentlemen, is that covert operations or spook gun I was talking about. This gun was most likely manufactured after the war based upon the serial number that's on the gun. But let me show you what the scrub marks look like. If you look at the polymer grips here, you'll notice that the CZ logo has been professionally milled out in a perfect circle. If you look right above it, this is where Nazi Germany put their marks, but this is also where Czechoslovakia put their marks, their acceptance marks on the frame. And you can see that's professionally milled out. On the top of the gun, you'll see a serial number, and then everything forward of that, all the manufacturer markings that would normally be there, have been milled down. You can see if you look at it from the side that there's a slight shelf there that should not be there. There should be Czechka, Zabojska, and other markings across the top, then the serial number, all gone. And then again on the grip panel on the other side, professionally milled out CZ logo. So if you do a search for this gun on the internet, you're probably going to find the same thing that I found. Not much. I found one page in the UK where a gentleman had a deactivated gun because of their laws. 
that had been scrubbed in the exact same way that this gun. It, it's, a, it's a twin sister to this gun. It looks identical to it in terms of how it's been defaced. Now he speculated that the gun was built from surplus parts that were left over after the German occupation of Czechoslovakia. The Czechs resumed production after the war and the Germans had gone through and proof marked all the individual pieces and then left them laying there in a pile. Well, the Czechs came in, scrubbed all the marks off. They didn't want to have any of the German markings on them and then put the guns out for sale. There's a problem with that. And this is where Ian from Forgotten Weapons comes in. I sent him pictures of this gun and he found the gun to be very intriguing. And he is the one that suggested to me that perhaps most likely this is a scrubbed gun for a military buyer or a, a contract buyer that wanted a firearm that was technically untraceable in the global scheme of things. The Germans didn't proof mark anything that wasn't already completed. They didn't just make a bunch of frames and put Waffenamps on them. They first assembled the guns, completed them, test fired them, and then put their acceptance marks on them. So there weren't a bunch of frames and slides laying around that had German markings on them. And there would be no reason to grind the CZ logo off. Even the Germans didn't do that. There, there weren't swastikas or anything on the grips, so there's no reason for them to deface the grips. No, I think Ian at Forgotten Weapons is probably right. This handgun was built after the war for a contract that was to be filled, but the buyer either ordered the guns defaced or defaced them professionally when they got them to wherever they were going for whatever conflict zone they were gonna wind up in. And that's what makes this handgun an interesting piece of history. Now, when I found this handgun, I found it sitting on the shelf, the used gun shelf of a local gun shop. They didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. They wanted 190 bucks for it. I think I talked them down to 150 and they were more than glad to get rid of it because nobody wanted it. I just rolled the dice. And then I started doing the research into the gun, and it turns out this is a very rare bird. What's the true story? We don't know. I doubt that it's leftover Nazi parts. Ian at Forgotten Weapons gave me a more plausible story because we know for a fact that other countries had done that. Take the Rhodesian conflict, for example. During the Rhodesian War, they defaced FN fouls and other subcontractors that were licensed manufacturers of fouls. They would deface the manufacturer's markings before they wound up in Rhodesia in the conflict. So having conflict guns like this that are defaced is actually something that's gone on quite often in the past. And so this is most likely a conflict zone, a gun that somebody didn't want it traced back to the original manufacturer, so they had plausible deniability having have actually purchased the gun from CZ directly. They could have purchased it through a third party, whatever. I don't understand global politics at that level, but I buy Ian's version of events more than what I found on the web because I highly doubt this is made from Nazi parts. All the functions and features of the gun are identical to the gun that I showed you at the opening of the video. It has the same magazine, still chambered for 32 ACP. Put some ammo in this, this old girl, chamber it. Got a round in the chamber, has the same safety mechanism, everything's the same. The, again, the guns continue on in production after the war has a slightly different finish. This is not a wartime finish. This is more of a polished blue that's worn off. Uh, the, the German gun has more of a military finish to it. And let's see how this little girl works. Now keep in mind, guys, these guns are very old and the springs are weak on them. And it's not uncommon to have the occasional malfunction. and it locked open. Now what's interesting about these handguns, they do have a magazine safety as I pointed out, it has a heel release when you drop the magazine out of the gun, you have to pry it out and when you do that it drops the slide. It's very similar to Japanese Nambu pistols and other guns of the era. It only locks open on the follower and once you remove the magazine the slide goes forward. But with the magazine out of the gun I can pull the trigger and the hammer doesn't fall because of that magazine safety. Pretty interesting piece of history if you ask me. Okay, let's take the gun apart and see what it looks like on the inside. Field stripping the little guy is pretty simple. Putting it back together takes a special touch. But first of all, to disassemble it, we're gonna go ahead and make sure it's empty. I dropped a magazine out with its heel release here. Pull the mag out. Go ahead and cock the pistol. 
check the chamber, make sure it's empty, which it is. And now what we're gonna do is you see a little cross pin right here, much like a 1911. I'm gonna push this pin in with this hand. I'm gonna keep my finger pressure on that while I roll the gun over, take my other hand, pull the slide slightly rearward. I'm pushing on that pin and now there's this little sliding lever here. Push the pin, slide the lever down, and you'll notice the pin frees up and comes out. Kind of an intricate little part. I can set that pin aside, and now once that pin is out, the gun will come apart into two separate assemblies. There is a side plate on the lower receiver. You can remove, I'm not going to do that, that will give you access to the safety mechanism and the trigger mechanism, uh, and there's no reason to do that for a basic field strip. I'm gonna set that aside. Now on the inside, this is a straight blowback gun, but it's pretty interesting how they've designed it. So I'm gonna take my recoil spring and guide rod out, and now this little piece right here sitting on top of the barrel actually just lifts off. And it doesn't matter which way it sets on the barrel, but it has little teeth that engage with the bottom of the barrel. And this is what the, the guide rod and spring run through. Once you take that out, notice what I do right here. First of all, I'm gonna take the barrel bushing, rotate it to about the one o'clock position, and pull the barrel bushing off. Now, notice those little teeth on the bottom of the barrel, and there's a slide cut right in the bottom. I'm gonna pull the, those teeth up to that slide cut, and that allows me to turn the barrel where the teeth are facing down, and now the gun will, or the slide will release the barrel, and now you fully disassembled it. Let's put the gun back together. Putting it back together is simply reversing the steps. Put those teeth facing downward and into the front of the slide, and then you kind of have to guess where those teeth are. Just push back slowly and try to rotate the barrel until it hits that spot in the slide where it can rotate up. It's a little bit of a guessing game. Then you rotate those teeth up and push the barrel all the way back. Now I'm gonna take the bushing, one o'clock position, put it on and rotate it. I'm gonna take my little locking piece here that the cross pin goes through Take my recoil spring and guide rod, slide all that in. And now I'm going to invert the pistol, holding everything like this so it's in place. Invert the pistol, line up the slide rails with the frame and the slide, slide everything together. And now I'm gonna rotate the gun over. I'm gonna push on the barrel assembly with my index finger, making sure that everything lines up and pull the slide slightly rearward. And now I can take that pin Put the pin in through the hole, push the little slider up, and now the gun is back together. Put the magazine in, because it does have that magazine safety. Do a quick function check. Locks open as it should. Drop the magazine out. The slide will drop and pull the trigger and the hammer does fire so the gun is ready to shoot again. The Military Arms channel is viewer supported. That means through Patreon, our viewers support the channel. YouTube demonetized gun channels, conservative speech channels, video game channels, knife channels, just about everybody. And it's forced us to look elsewhere to support our channels, to support our growth, and we chose to do that through Patreon. There's a link down below. Please click that link and learn more about becoming a Patreon supporter and what that means and what we give back to you guys as a thank you for directly supporting us here at the Military Arms Channel. Another great way to support us is to swing by our Forge from Freedom store, which is forgefromfreedom.com forward slash military arms. You can pick up shirts like this one. You wanna vote for a Democrat, a Republican, or the AR-15? AR-15. But guys, seriously, you can pick those shirts up over at forgefromfreedom.com forward slash military arms, or just follow the link in the description down below. Thanks for supporting us, guys. My challenge target falling plate rack is calibrated for nine millimeter. Let's see if these little 32 ACPs will knock the plates over a little further than seven yards away. Look at that, it did. <laughs> Have a round left here. And that was my last round. This little gun shoots pretty good. It's surprisingly comfortable to shoot. It doesn't have any recoil to speak of. And the little 32 ACP is a fairly potent little cartridge, although I kind of draw my line for personal defense at 380 and much prefer nine millimeter. Doesn't take away from the fun factor though. The ammunition we're shooting this afternoon is 73 grain Fiocchi ammunition. 
It's a little tiny 32 ACP 765 Browning. And this comes from our friends over at Freedom Munitions. We do have a 6% off discount code down below if you use the code MAC. Give you 6% off anything in the store, either Freedom Munitions branded stuff or even the Fiocchi ammunition. We shoot an awful lot of Fiocchi and we shoot an awful lot of Freedom Munitions here on the channel. But uh, yeah, take advantage of that code. All right, we have the magazine loaded up. Let's grab our conflict zone gun. And we're probably about 15 yards away from our little round target there. Ah, ah. My hands are oily from using the CLP and these slide serrations are very, very faint on the gun. And it's kind of hard for me to get a hold of it there. We've shot quite a bit of ammo surprisingly this afternoon. You can see the gun starting to get dirty. All right, let's see how well this little guy shoots at about 15 yards. I mean, you can see we're shooting a nice group on that steel plate down there. It's a challenge target. And uh, yeah, this is a surprisingly good shooting little pistol. I'd feel pretty confident if I had this little guy in my pocket as a backup gun. But uh, again, that 32 ACP, just a little bit underpowered for my tastes, but a lot of fun to shoot. I love the 32 ACP guns for range guns. Ammo isn't horribly expensive and they're really, really pleasant to shoot, especially if you're getting a new shooter in to the sport and you want to step up from 22 long rifle. 32 ACP is a great step up cartridge to get them into center fire before moving them up to more powerful, uh, powerful calibers. Well, I can't get out of here, it seems, without Jason giving me another challenge. So he wants me to hit an expired paint can downrange sitting on top of the challenge target. We're about 15, 20 yards away, and uh, these sights are pretty sparse, but judging by my group, it looks like it's a little bit right, maybe a little bit low. Let's see if I can hit that paint can. I hit it right across the left side, I think. But I got it the first shot. Let's go ahead and run the magazine out. Huh, sweet shooting little pistol. Looks like I won again, just barely though. Come here and check it out. Eh, you know what? That may have been a more solid hit than I thought. No, I nicked it. <laughs> I think I aimed just a little too far left, but I still won. Sorry, man. All right, guys, it's time to wrap things up this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at this interesting piece of history. There's conflicting information out there. If you can find any info on this gun, I'm sure, sure some of you guys will find the same website that I found, but you're gonna find that there's not really a whole lot of information about these guns and how they came to be in the condition that they're in in terms of being scrubbed of their markings. The article I found said that it was made from old Nazi parts that were left over from occupation manufacturing. I don't buy it, don't believe it. I do think that Ian is probably correct in the fact that this gun was manufactured post-war and the markings were scrubbed off for whatever reason for a conflict zone. So I, I suspect that this is a spook gun or a conflict zone gun that was manufactured for just that purpose, for some sort of operations that nobody wanted to ever talk about and wanted to erase from the history books. And they pretty much effectively have done that because we really don't know the true backstory on this gun. However, the fact that I've seen pictures of other guns that look just like this one means there is a backstory there somewhere. And that mystery to me makes this gun very interesting and intriguing and it will remain in my collection. And I got it for a great price just one of those mini gems you can find if you shop around at the gun stores when you're traveling around the country like we do. All right, guys, we're going to tie things up. Going to head home, fire off my last few rounds here. If you would like to support us another way, a great way to do that is to swing by and check out Copper Custom. It's coppercustom.com. It's our online store. We have a lot of great products at great prices. Also, if you haven't already, swing by and check us out over on full30.com. That's full30.com. In today's times with YouTube doing all sorts of crazy stuff, Banning this, banning that, demonetization, full 30 is where a lot of folks are going in the gun community, so check it out. All right, last magazine here, and then we're going to head home. Yep, that's it. This little gun has given surprisingly good performance this afternoon. No malfunctions. All right, guys, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you later. All right. Last five rounds here.
to get me one of these. I'll give you 200 bucks for it, Tim. 